technology. As a thought leader providing insight into immersive technology, she brings solutions and innovation in smart tech hygiene. Amy was manager of content and digital media for the think tank division of Lee and Fung, a leading global consumer goods sourcing and manufacturing company based in Hong Kong. Her experience, or, sorry, her expertise includes conducting bespoke research and sea level reports within technology, retail, and cross genre applications. Um, before I turn it over to Amy, though, I just want to mention one thing. There's a known problem with Oculus headsets, uh, including the Go and the Quest, where um, sometimes the screen behind me will go blank. It will go gray, black, or white. If that happens to you, you can re-enter the space, and that usually fixes the problem. Uh, to re-enter, you go into the menu, you go to Settings, General, and there's a button you can click there that says Re-enter space. Uh, and if you have that problem right now, somebody mentioned that they did, uh, you can give it a shot and see if that doesn't fix the problem. And now I'll turn it over to Amy. Uh, oh, I'm okay. going to mute to the audience, by the way, um, for the duration of the talk. And then we're going to open it up for questions at the end. Go ahead, Amy. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, that is a very... A uh, big introduction to live up to. Um, thank you everyone for coming today. I apologize for my avatar. I'm on a borrowed uh, headset because mine stopped working and this one is clearly having some uh, some body issues. So <laughs> I'm here um, and it's really great to see everybody in the room. Um, I think that I don't have control over my own slides. So if you don't mind um, jumping into the next slide or the first slide rather. There we go. So today um, I'm talking about healthcare and um, immersive technologies. And uh, for just a little bit of background, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Cleanbox uh, Technology Incorporated. What we do uh, is we provide um, a hygiene solution for people, companies, organizations, healthcare institutions using headsets, using any kind of virtual augmented or mixed reality in their uh, programs. And we kind of do the part that people forget about until the last the last minute and that is making sure the headsets are not transferring from one uh, contagion from one person to the next also making sure that when you put a headset on and you come to beautiful spaces like this you're not feeling or smelling the sweat or odors or anything else from the person before you and uh, that might seem like a little thing but actually ultimately it really has a big hand in how uh, successful your XR deployment plays out um, we at Cleanbox Tech are a small but really a critical uh, part of that process and we work to uh, meet a pain point that we think we resolve very, very well. We do it for all of the developers and for uh, everybody else in the industry. So we're really uh, focused on collaboration and partnerships because what um, we, we're, we're believers in uh, a rising tide helps float all boats. So in healthcare specifically, this is one of our primary verticals that we're focused on and we work with them right now. And the reason it's so important to us is because um, we see great opportunity there. Um, it's not focused just on one specific use case or one, one specific problem solving, uh, problem to solve rather. There seem to be a huge array of it. So I'm gonna not focus on entertainment or enterprise or education or, or anything else that is really, really important to XR, just on healthcare right now. Um, so some of our pay, some of our clients, we see on on both sides of the equation. We see um, physicians uh, in in terms of both training and practicing or rehearsal ahead of a surgery. Uh, for instance, uh, we have clients that are using um, some sort so, sort of XR, whether it be VR or mixed reality or augmented reality, uh, pre uh, and post op. And there are some use cases that are starting to be explored in operation. Um, and that's just on the physician side and the education side. On the patient side, I think it's been a bit easier for the uh, general population to understand XR because of the types of um, patient applications that there are out there. Pain mitigation being one of the primary ones. Everyone, um, both anecdotally and otherwise, is able to kind of look at the data that's out there, look at the experiences that are being provided and see that, wow, here's something huge that we can do in XR that um, surprisingly, we are not able to do in other ways. Maybe we could even solve this problem in a better way. 
um, pain mitigation, trauma therapy, and overall life enhancement. Now, you can think of these terms socially because they are all socially important, but ultimately when you want to get a business off the ground and you want to get a company to pay for something, you have to not only show them the social importance, but the business um, value. And this is something that I think in healthcare specifically, I see helping lead the way across the industry because there are so many positive use cases showing quantifiable ROI. Um, so these are a few ways that we're working right now in healthcare, uh, or rather we are supporting those who are working in healthcare. And do you mind moving to the next slide, please? So we have um, these great ideas. We have these great opportunities. Maybe uh, this tech has finally caught up with itself in a way that it wasn't you know, 10, 20 years ago, but now we're seeing the, the opportunities in a very tangible way. Um, we are very excited about the content that's being created, the, the better um, eye tracking, the better uh, avatars, the better uh, sync, the better battery lives, frankly, the better form factors. Um, but those are, those are one piece of the puzzle. When you're thinking about, now we've got this, this proof of concept that we believe in, how are we going to deploy it? And I think this is the next critical step that I'm hoping um, people begin to talk about more and more as we see these events happening. Um, obviously, most people know that if you want to build a house, you can't just say, hey, here's the house I want and go to Home Depot or, or whatever your equivalent of Home Depot might be in whatever country you're in and buy the parts and build it. You have to plan, you have to hire the experts, and you have to have a strategy and a budget. So I think um, I one of those critical parts, um, we are seeing more and more companies kind of band together in terms of data resources, in terms of um, the proper ecosystem and how to set it up. Talk about the ABCs of strategy to making all of the work that you're doing in XR a success. Next slide, please. Obviously, you cannot build a, a, a proper building without a proper foundation. So when you're thinking about XR and you're thinking about all these amazing use cases in healthcare that we just discussed, whether it be therapy or education or training, you think about your specific use case for, for the application that you're targeting. And what you're really looking at is the value proposition because you're going to have to propose this entire thing to somebody who's gonna write a check. Ultimately, it takes the money and the investment both on the financial side as well as the uh, uh, ecosystem and infrastructure side. So what is your value um, I was on, a, I hosted a webinar uh, about a week ago with AIXR where um, someone was on there from Sixth Sense and she gave me a couple, of, gave her credit because a couple of these R's were um, inspired by something she said. And that is thinking about the value proposition of the content and the piece that you're promoting or the, or the pain point that you're solving. Um, is it reliable? Is it relatable? Think about re-education as the entire experience. Now, I say reliable because obviously there's a tech component to, be, to reliability, um, but you can have the same results in a, let's just call it a beta study, and let's say you uh, consistently show X percentage of decreased pain in this particular use case. Are those results repeatable? And what you're targeting is in your plan, remember we're still in the planning stage, thinking about how to take those results and make them repeatable reliable, repeatable, and then you have to think about re-education. And the reason I say that is because everyone in this room is most likely a, a, a fan of XR, right? You're here, you're in all space, you have your avatar, you've probably been here before, you're looking around, you know how to send out an, emo an emoji. Um, so you're not completely um, uh, a newbie. Um, but thinking about that, a lot of people are. We don't have broad consumer adoption yet. And so when you think about the reasons why, one of the main reasons is you ask a person on the street in, an, in a taxi cab, um, a random person, what do you think about VR? And generally, if they're not, if they're not experienced, they might have a remembrance, a, a reference of something that is no longer valid. I've heard a lot of times people say, I can't do VR because I get motion sickness. Now, there are a very few number of people that will probably could possibly always get motion sickness, no matter what the kind of experience is. But the fact is, that's a tech problem that has been fairly uh, reliably solved uh, in most cases. So um, the same thing when it comes to the headset. Will it fit over my glasses? Well, I guess it depends on which headset you're wearing. But there are very, um, you know, those first experiences, good or bad, are what people remember. 
So when you're thinking about the value proposition you're bringing to your XR strategy, you have to think about the re-education of what somebody's predisposition or prejudices around the experience might already be. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I won't spend too much time on each of these points, but I do think that they're really important to think about when you're, when you're strategizing your deployment. Know your audience. Um, you know, if I'm going to talk about this today, I'm talking to people who already know OXR. If I were to say this to somebody, let's just say, I don't know, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not in healthcare, I'm, I'm, I'm at a movie theater, I'm, a, you know, maybe I'm a, at a preschool. I, so my audience, my audience changes my message. And I think that's the most important to think about when you're thinking about how to, to share your message. It's presentation, right? It's uh, the right words. I could, I'll give you an example from my company. We deal with decontamination and drawing of headsets. So if, we, if I say to you, <laughs> we use UVC LEDs to decontaminate and dry HMDs between users, you're like, I, oftentimes I hear, wow, that's so amazing. Um, so what do you do? And the reason is because I've clearly, not, I've clearly not tailored that message to that particular audience. Sometimes I just say, well, actually, I just clean and dry the headsets. And suddenly that, that makes sense to somebody who's maybe not in the same uh, mindset because their business is different than mine. Seems like a pretty straightforward thing to think about, but sometimes it's the simple things that escape us. And the third thing about your strategy and planning, the scalability. Um, you have to both consider the audience. Are you a large company that is taking this healthcare um, application and you're wanting to put it in the hands of private practitioners? Are you trying to scale it across your hospital? Are you trying to scale it in individual therapies? Are you really just part of the software division that is packaging with a piece of um, think, about, think about the time requirements, location, and cross-culture. And I would just mention cross-culture because um, it is very, very easy to take your living or business space. It's about people in parallel universes, if you will, um, that are probably or, or most likely have small nuances that will change their experience. So when you're thinking about your best strategy for, de for, for deployment, you need to take all of those nuances into account. It's the little things that matter. Um, if someone's going to buy in to an XR strategy, they've already gotten to the point to believe in it. So the failure points change. They change from having to convince somebody that it's good to go to showing them how they can get past these little tiny hurdles that have much larger um, consequences than you might imagine. Do you mind moving to the next slide? So you strategize, you have your value proposition, you have your buy-in, you know your audience, you're targeted. Now you have to actually deploy it. And sometimes uh, this is a hard part, but really if you've done the first part uh, thoroughly, it makes this part a lot easier. So when you do this, actually before you do this, you need to think about these three things, infrastructure and training, hygiene, safety and logistics, and operational planning. So infrastructure and training, is the system set up to accommodate an XR program? In other words, have you thought about which headsets you're going to use? Is there real estate in that particular hospital or healthcare center or education institution? Um, do you have the proper training internally? Do people know how to use a headset? Do they know how to get into alt space or do they know how to use a haptic? Is that important? Um, it's not a one-time investment, it's a long-term investment. And then ultimately you will see adoption Think about if you have kids or a niece or nephew or somebody, some, a child in your family. Um, if you're maybe over the age of 30, then you might not have grown up with an iPad to entertain you when you were two years old. But I can guarantee you, most of the children who have access to an iPad right now, they probably know how to figure out their parents' password already. And that's because the adoption is starting for them at a younger age. So there will have to be that same learning curve when you're thinking about deploying something successfully in, uh, to an audience that is uh, still learning. Um, hygiene, safety, and logistics. And this is where I'll come in in terms of what our company does. Hygiene is much more important than you might think. Now, I, I'm a bit of a germaphobe. I might already be thinking about it. Um, but if you really want to think about the reasons, maybe you're not a germaphobe but you want your program to be successful. You want uh, this to be adopted. Think about what would stop somebody from re-engagement. Now it's not just somebody trying the first time that makes it, success makes it successful, it's how many times they are willing to do it again. 
Do you have the re-engagement? Have you thought about all the obstacles, all the hurdles and all the pain points? Because if you have it, then they will come up at some point. And in my experience, um, both in healthcare and again in other uh, industries, these are the critical, uh, the main pain points that come up that people forget to think about. Hygiene, safety, logistics. Um, safety, so what my company does, again, we, we clean and dry the headsets for simplicity. We use medical grade UVC lights so that we can decontaminate them without it, using any heat or toxins. So the headsets will not be uh, affected, the plastics won't be degraded, the lenses will be safe. Um, you're, you're not using uh, ozone or any other kind of toxins um, that are out there for other kinds of cleaning products. And so it's safe for you and the end, con the end consumer or the end patient. Um, in terms of logistics, you know, you have to think of charging and storage and charging will probably come up soon because I was actually uh, in alt space last night getting ready for this and talking to someone and suddenly my battery died and I'd only been in alt space for about 10, 15 minutes. So um, these are these are logistics that will hopefully they will take, you know, there will be progress in terms of technology, but you have to you have to plan for the adoption curve and the progress curve. And then that comes into your operational planning. Um, generally speaking, if I'm, if I'm talking to people that have already deployed, you already know the type of planning that goes into this. Um, but you do need to take into to account the same things in an XR strategy as you would in a physical or otherwise um, traditional operational strategy. Um, this is just a quote from uh, Brennan Spiegel, um, who heads up the VR division at Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles. Um, I can't actually read it uh, from my screen here. Maybe you can read it better than I can, but basically he's saying that they use CleanBox to uh, decontaminate their headsets as an example of how they are successfully thinking about scaling up in their use of VR and their, their use cases. Next slide, please. Um, so why is this important? Well, it does come back to re-engagement, adoption, right? So there's, as, as I kind of alluded to before, there's a, a bit of a learning curve and a bit of an adoption curve in terms of what people, whether that be patients or physicians, doctors, nurses, um, support staff, admin, expect. But as technology and technology like, like the type we're in right now, begin to change um, and offer new ways of experience, they begin to impact the way customers and patients and healthcare providers expect to get their information and experience. So as that is impacting the customer, it's the customer in turn will force that change, whether it be slowly or quickly, back on the, the providers of the knowledge or the expertise or so on. Um, thinking of, in terms of this about personnel efforts, the minimization of human error, these, these user experiences, and I won't list them all for time, um, but these are all critical components when you're thinking about your value proposition. Next slide, please. So because I mentioned that we work in multiple verticals, entertainment is one of them. I call it the, I think it's the low hanging fruit of XR. Um, I call it the sort of gateway, if you will, into broader adoption. Um, but there are some lessons that are universal. One is engagement, re-engagement, and finally adoption. Now, you're not gonna, you might do XR once and say, oh, I'm an addict, I'm committed, I'm done. I, you know, I don't care if my, like right now, my avatar's arms are all over the place. I can guarantee you, if this was my first time doing this, that would not be satisfactory for me, <laughs> to be honest, to be completely frank. I'm looking at myself right here. I see my arms are on one side and there's, you know, due to technological problems and headset problems, hardware problems, I can't fix that. Um, that might be small right now for the room, um, but it might not be small for someone that maybe is, is given um, a VR strategy as part of their uh, therapy. If you want them to do, if you want therapy to success, be successful, then the patient has to actually do it. This is one of the components to re-engagement because it takes that kind of success for you to have full adoption. Um, better understanding, better answers. Um, again, this comes back to how you're taking that content and what you're doing with it. What is the focus? What is the purpose of it? Now, there's there's what I call a 10 minute limit. You can call it whatever else you want that maybe sounds a little bit more articulate, but I call it a 10 minute limit because if you cannot live in something for 10 minutes, you will not repeat it. And I don't care if that's VR or XR or 
a certain hotel that you suddenly hate and you don't want to be there anymore or a city that you know gives you bad vibes or it doesn't matter what your scenario is what your your situation or the the um stimuli around you if you don't like something if you want to leave it after 10 minutes you're not going to go back to it and the exact same is true in an alternative reality which is what we're in um so think about the things that would stop somebody from long-term engagement um, next slide. So hygiene again, what difference does it really make? So let's just, I'll keep it brief and to the point because I get grossed out by this too. Um, here's a child and I don't have any children, but I certainly know <laughs> plenty of them and I, I love them all. And anytime I'm around a bunch of kids for longer than a couple of hours, I usually get sick. I get a cold, I get a cough, I start sneezing. And that's just because kids are a little beautiful germ bots and they like to share these this <laughs> their experience with everybody else so and and think about these things in terms of how long we've been sitting here now which i'm not exactly sure but long enough to have um i, I guarantee that you're probably feeling your headset getting a little warm right now um i have mine plugged in just because i don't want to i want to make sure that my battery doesn't die mid mid uh sentence um but it's a little warm on my face so i'm certain that i'm sweating um I'm not wearing makeup fortunately i don't have to be camera ready for this but if I was, I'm sure it would be smeared all over my mask. So then I think about, okay, how have I been on a plane? Well, I was on a plane for eight hours yesterday. So uh, could I be sick? Sure, if I start coughing. Okay, let's think about these practically speaking because what you're really talking about is contagions. You're talking about the soft surfaces or the hard surfaces of your headset. This is why hygiene matters, not just from a user comfortability point of view, but thinking about it in terms of risk mitigation. Why does risk mitigation matter? because you care about a successful deployment. Next slide. This is a graph that if you wanna grab it, you can. Um, I go into the numbers also because they're teeny tiny and I can't read them from here. Um, but this is just showing a hospital acquired infections and how grave of a problem it is. I know that there's a significant problem here in the US where I am um, and it's very, very easy to have happen because you have a bunch of sick people in the same shared space and contagions are shared. Next slide. Risks and outbreaks. Um, again, this comes back to shared hardware um, and shared mass use hardware. Uh, if you have your own headset, it's a little bit different, although I have to say I clean mine all the time um, just because I'm, I'm, but if you are in an office and you have, let's say five headsets for 50 people, um, this matters because of all of these reasons. We want greater adoption. We want more people to use it. Therefore, you know, with, with that's a good problem to have, but you, it is something you have to think about. Next slide. So this is us, Cleanbox Technology. Um, like I said, we use UVC light, which has been known to uh, kill uh, bacteria, virus, and fungi for the last several decades. It's, very, it's a very known and trusted technology worldwide. Um, it is relatively new that this technology is available in an LED. What that does is it allows us to do it, again, decontaminate at the same level of efficacy and sometimes without the use of mercury tubes, without the use of heat. So what we provide, this is our CX-1. It cleans one headset at once. If you, There's no headset in this box, but basically have a, uh, an adjustable hook that fits every type of headset that's currently on the market. Um, hopefully they will only get smaller, not bigger, but we shall see. Um, and then what we do is uh, it decontaminates and in the same 60 second cycle, it dries the headset. We also have a third component, which is a super hydrophobic nano coating that we provide for the soft surfaces. It's basically a one time, you know, you spray it on, uh, let's say the fabric on an Oculus Co um, and you know, you're good to go. You don't have to do it again. Uh, it's one time, you know, maybe a year later, you'll check it out and say, hey, should I spray this thing again? But generally what that does is it keeps sweat and other moisture uh, at the surface of the headset, then our box blows it off and decontaminates it. So this is just a box that cleans one at once. We have all sorts of uh, product that cleans multiples, twos, fours, sixes, stackable, customizable. Um, next slide, please. And that's all I have for you guys today. Um, I appreciate you listening and I would love to answer any questions you might have. Okay, so I'm going to open it up now for questions. Sure. Uh, it takes a second. There we go. Uh, now, if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand and uh, 
I'll give you a megaphone. <laughs> okay, we have our first question from Caitlin. Caitlin, uh, accept, and you've got it. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Clear? Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, Hi, Caitlin. Great be Hi, great to meet you in virtuality. Um, I feel like we've been talking before about wellness and tech. I work in the social, emotional, and mindfulness space with a lot of mm. uh, therapy through, um, you know, both in VR and also in person, but you're starting to see more adoption. Uh, I love the whole presentation. I felt like it was really applicable, and of course, I'm curious about everything to do with clean box tech. Um, I guess one of the questions I would have is when people, I'm imagining some of the, the hurdles that you mentioned earlier. So I actually had two questions. The first one is just hearing a little bit more about um, the tiny hurdles that have um, bigger consequences. You know, like you said, it's the little things that matter. Do you have any like use cases you could give as examples of what those little tweaks are. Um, and the second part is when people start class, can they get a membership to like bring in headsets to you uh, once a year for the ultrasonic cleaning? And, or do they usually have on site a device that they use? Sure. Just because I, I blanked out there for a few minutes when I, my headset got hot. So speaking of, <laughs> speaking of tech <laughs> issues that, that stop up. <laughs> prevents a successful deployment. Um, but I think I heard most of the question. And so I think what you're Perfect. asking is how, how does the process work? Is it like done like once a day, once a year, once a week? What's, is that the essence of your question? Uh, in yeah, terms no. of he headsets. So no, what we do, part. yeah, that was the second mm -hmm. part. Okay. What was the first part? The first part is totally separate. Okay. Um, you talked about the, the tiny hurdles uh, that have big, big consequences. Um, mm -hmm. You know, once your audience has bought into XR, what are those tiny tweaks? And I was wondering if you could give a use case or some example about the tiny tweaks that really um, made the onboarding experience easier for someone who already has adopted XR but wants to have a smooth experience. Mm, sure, sure. Those are really great questions. Um, so in terms of tiny tweaks, um, well, again, I think this this hot headset right here is is one of them. Um, and I'll give you a use case without mentioning names because I, I, I didn't ask permission ahead of time, but there's a um, uh, an anesthesiologist uh, in Europe who uses uh, VR uh, for his patients ahead of, um, you know, whether or not they're, whatever procedure they're going into. Um, some of the, uh, he's had, um, you know, various levels of, of testing that process uh, and a lot of uh, very successful um, applications of it where and by measuring success he measures it by well what was the patient's uh, verbal response and experience during pre pre during and post and also uh, did this mean that I had to give him uh, a lesser amount of, of drugs to put him under right so that's a particular use case where one of the, um, uh, he mentioned that one of the tweaks uh, that he would like to fix in the future hasn't been fixed yet, is that some of these patients have to be under for a longer period of time. So after 45 minutes, they might already finish the VR experience. And that, there, was a, there were a couple of patients that he mentioned this about. Uh, and again, I'm not, I'm not quoting his study because I don't have it here, but a, uh, offline, I'd be happy to, you know, more in-depth answer questions. But uh, he, his said, he said basically a couple of the patients were completely, um, it was completely effective for them until the VR experience ended. Now, most likely someone developing content for 45 minutes, that's a really long time in VR right now. But thinking yeah. about use cases like that and anticipating, and again, comes back to your very specific use case, that is very specific. Um, and thinking ahead about, okay, what else could I anticipate? Is it the hot headset that's suddenly gonna shut itself down? Is it gonna be, we run out of content after 45 minutes? Uh, or maybe just like this person has a really big head or a really small head. Does this headset actually even fit? Now I don't have, I, I, I would consider myself a, a normal size head, but I can tell you right now that I can look down and still see through my headset, right? So there's a gap there. Um, so that could interrupt the, the 360 component. Um, that's mm -hmm. the first question. And the second one was how we're deployed. Right now, um, we have product that we that people buy um, and they take it and they use it on site. Uh, we also have leasing programs that were in development that will be available this summer. Um, that is our, our plan right now. 
And basically what it does is what we encourage people to do, it's intended uses to use it per person. So it's a 60 second cycle, one minute generally, if you have any level of hygiene strategy at all, which you should, um, I, to be honest, some people, uh, it's easy to become uh, lazy or, or look at timing as, as more important. Um, but 60 seconds, whether you're cleaning one or four or six or 20 at the same time, if you've got 20 headsets and a high throughput, pretty uncommon in healthcare, but could happen, um, it, you, we spend one minute to decontaminate it in that way. Um, we intend it to be used pe between per people per person. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there are also, um, you know, more specialized use cases where it might say be in, um, you know, like a, in an isolation ward, for instance, agents that you have to reach. Um, we can change our cycle times from 60 seconds to three minutes, four minutes, depending on what kind of efficacy you have for a particular use case. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Definitely. And I'm, I'm just like you, I was laughing. Talking about the hygiene and then I'm germaphobe <laughs> and I want things to feel you know interfere yeah. with the experience. Thank well, you. that's a really good good point because you said relax and enjoy, which is kind of a critical part mm -hmm. of you know if you're really thinking about something being effective. Uh, oftentimes the pain points that XR is trying to solve has to do with people either being afraid to go to the doctor or afraid of the actual experience or not understanding it. Those are all fear and pain motivations. If you're relaxed and enjoying it, that has double benefit. Thank you for the questions. Yeah. Sure thing. Thank you. Okay. We have another question from Jim. Uh, thank you for your patience, Jim. Oh. Hi. Thanks, Ron. Hi, Amy. Um, Hi. How are you? I'm having a bit of a hard time hearing you, though. Oh, okay. You should have your microphone on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I have the microphone on. Okay. Can you better now? Uh, slightly. I'll just listen carefully. <laughs> okay. Can you recommend any um, uh, equipment for professionals and consumers that would effectively disinfect their headsets? Uh, well, certainly my own. <laughs> um, I, I would say, yeah, well, and so that is what we try to provide because, or I'm sorry, when I say try, we do provide because we support any kind of headset out there. Um, and if you're talking about the HMDs, I think that, you know, there are a lot of really great um, HMD, um, there are a lot of really great headset options out there. One might work better for a specific case than another. Um, right now, we're, we're more a first to market company. So we're our, you know, primarily what people have been using to date has been alcohol wipes or, you know, covers or the those types of barriers, which which are, uh, well, first of all, barriers are fine in and of themselves. They don't decontaminate. They're simply a barrier uh, for like detritus or something like that. Um, alcohol actually is highly effective if you leave it wet on a surface for two to four minutes, which nobody does and also can't be done on soft surfaces. So in terms of actually real decontamination, that's not sort of a false sense of uh, security or safety or, or cleanliness, if you will. Um, it is, you do need to have something that will actually kill the bacteria, virus, and fungi. And that's, that's what we do. Okay, thanks. I, I wasn't sure if your, your, your uh, company provides or, or services the consumer and the professional market. You know, well, we do. We're prime. I mean, we're primarily B two B right now because really, I think the consumer market is a little less focused. Oftentimes, it's more of a one to one ratio in terms of their headsets to person. Um, but that being said, you know, we work across the range with small businesses and we try to work with, you know, what opportunities, you know, people bring us. And obviously we want the industry as a whole to grow. So, you know, in the future, we're more than happy to, you know, serve the consumer base as well. I can tell you right now, I have a clean box in my, in my apartment, uh, here in New York city. Um, and I, I use it on myself, even though it's just me using my headset. Um, and that's just because, you know, just you, you're, you're in a headset, you sweat. It's pretty, pretty human. I don't know. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. yeah. My pleasure. Good. Okay. Anybody else? Question? Comment? No. 
Yeah, no, that's it. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I, well, I really appreciate you all being here today. Thank you. Yeah, let's uh, give Amy a big hand. You did a great job. Very interesting talk. Thank you. I had no Thank idea this was even a thing. <laughs> 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 well, hopefully it's a thing that we can uh, we we can tell you. Hey, here's a problem, but good news, we already solved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So feel free to reach out to me on these any any of these channels here. That's my email on the on the screen. Um, those are our uh, company Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook handles. Um, more than happy to answer any questions at any time. And again, um, hope you have a a good evening or morning or afternoon wherever you are. Okay, and thank you all for coming. This was the last presentation in this chunk in this room. So uh, you can hang out here if you want. If you leave, you can't get back in, but it doesn't matter because <laughs> nothing is.